Amen. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are at 2 Samuel chapter 12, where um, the prophet Nathan came to rebuke David. For today, we will continue from verse 15. You can put your Bible there at 2 Samuel 5, uh, chapter 12, verse 15. But we were talking about a few issues last week. So I thought I want to just uh, finish, finish some of the issues and questions that this whole episode of David's sin, adultery with Bathsheba, and the murder of Uriah, okay? Um, this whole episode raises a number of questions. Last week, we talked about temptation. Uh, we talked about the fall of a godly man. Yeah, uh, and we see that godly people, even though they are men of God, great men of God, they do fall. Yes. So the question here that people may be asking is, why did God allow? Constantly, we find that God, people ask questions when, when big events happen, when important people fall, we ask this question, why did God allow? And we may ask the question too, why God allowed Uriah to die at David's scheme? Uriah was a victim. He was innocent. And on top of that, he was a good person. He was a very honorable person. How can an, God allow an honorable person to die? So when we ask a question like this, actually we don't realize the implication the implication of what we are asking as to say that God shouldn't allow means we are asking why God does not control or God does not program people and their actions. You know, like God control a robot, nah? control Uriah, uh, David's actions or David's uh, plans so that Uriah does not die. Okay, so it looks like we, we may not realize we are asking why God does not make robots out of us. In that sense. So the real question to work out is, is God a manipulator of human events? Yeah, the real question is, does God manipulate human events so that, okay, the good person does not die, the bad person straight away? Or is God truly sovereign enough to work with the choices and the actions of men, whether good people or bad people, is God really sovereign? Is he really in control enough so that with working with the choices and the actions of both good and bad people, he can still accomplish his will and purpose? And so that will allow mankind to have their choice to carry out their actions and then to see the results, okay? To suffer the consequences. And all the while, this, all these kinds of events going on uh, will still somehow work to accomplish God's will and purpose. So the real onus is not, is not on what God should do. Not that. Or why didn't God just do simply this, do this thing, this thing simply because he's powerful and almighty. Also, we expect God to kind of control the control the situation, control the actions, control the consequences. The real onus is actually on ourselves. So as people with limited power, that's exactly the point. We have limited power and we have choices and we have what I think we learned in economics, something called opportunity. opportunity cost. That means if you want to do this with your resources, then you cannot have those. If you want to have those, then there are certain things you can. So as people with limited power and this concept of opportunity cost, you choose this, then you can't have that. If you want to have something else, you cannot have another thing. Both good and bad, all right? 
the opportunity cost of something we miss out, both good and bad. So as people with limited power and opportunity cost, do we choose to do what is right and good for ourselves and for others and not just selfishly? So we act based on thinking about other people, the good of everybody. And that's where God comes in with his commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. A choice there for us to make. Okay, so to expect God to intervene and make all things right implies actually then we don't need to be self-responsible. Okay, if we expect God to intervene and make everything correct, then it's actually saying no, no need to be responsible for myself. I don't need to develop any right attitudes and values, and I don't need to worry about making right choices and actions. That's why God will make God will make everything okay. See, so if that's the case, then we as people create a mess and commit evil, and then we just expect God to clear up all our messes. Uh. So the question comes down to, what would that make God? You know, what would that make God if every time we make bad choices, God clears up, God stops? Is God a cosmic cleaner of human messes? And then human beings, humans, human beings happily go on to create mess after mess while God cleans up behind us. What, what does that make of us? You know, um, the picture just came to my mind. You, you know, some dog owners, dog owners, they walk the dog, huh? then the dog shit along in the park. And then the owner has to clean up after the dog. So that, that is what God becomes basically, the owner that comes and cleans up after the dog, each time the dog shits in the park. Right? So, so the dog has no responsibility. And if that is what God does for us human beings, leaving masses without a sense of responsibility, then we don't learn. We don't learn and we don't need to change and we can stay horrible. But where would that lead everybody? It leads us nowhere. We don't become better people. And what would be the point of such existence? Oh, we are no better than a dog on God's leash. We go to anywhere in the park, we, we feel the need, we just shit. Yeah, excuse the word. Okay, so what would be the point of such existence for us as human beings? Right? And then what would be the point for God you know, where he created us? So you can see if we really understand the implications that we think God should not allow and short God should clear the mess or prevent the mess, right? Then we see that there's no there's no no purpose in creating us. There's no purpose in our existence. Whether on God's part or on our human part, there is really nothing to accomplish. So we need actually two things, huh? see ourselves for who we are and what we are like. Secondly, we need to ask ourselves, what is our role and purpose here? And then that's where we have the questions that lead to something more important. Questions that lead to something more important. And these questions would now lead us to see the necessity and importance of choice responsibility and not just unrestricted unrestrained freedom which leads to sin and when sin gets worse chaos so it is people whether non-believer or christian who fail to understand god and what god is doing or what god is accomplishing through every aspect of our choices and life direction 
that carry on the cycles of sin and problems in their own respectable ways. You know, everybody thinks they are good. We all think we are good. We are all religious and we believe that we, we are very good people. All right. And we act in our own respectable ways behind our own belief systems. And yet you see the world is still a mess. Yeah. For example, the church, not criticism of any particular congregation, but church as a human whole. You see, there are still problems and conflicts and struggles within the church among Christians themselves. All very respectable, all behind their own belief systems, but nowhere near perfect. Yeah, nowhere near that good, that the church has no problems. Yeah. So God's sovereignty as Almighty God is in his power to use what we do and make of ourselves to arrive at the purposeful, to arrive at the purposeful destiny he created us for. So here is the thing about God's sovereignty and God's power. Whatever we choose. He leaves us to make, okay? but he will work to arrive at the purposeful destiny he has created us for. Based on our willingness, our choices to obey him. So we should determine what God made us for. It's very important for us to know why we are made by God and put here on earth. Yeah. And then we work out that divine purpose for ourselves as God intends. Okay, so let me highlight that part as an action that, that really we should be focusing on. We should determine what God made us for and work out that divine purpose for ourselves as he really intends and why he created us. So coming back to David's life, overall, as a summary statement of David's life, God views David as a man after his own heart. Nevertheless, God is not blind to his imperfections, nor does he cover up what David did. He just, in the Bible, he just simply records all the ugly flaws of David's sin. Yes, and then the Bible tells us that God was displeased with what David had done. Okay, so there God responds to David's action. And the fact that God was displeased shows that God has standards and expectations of David and also us as his children and people. Okay, so God has standards and expectations. God expects us to work through our negative thoughts, our emotions, our desires, our flaws, our weaknesses, our insecurities, our instabilities, our imperfections, as well as our responsibilities to realize. The word realize here means not discover only, but work towards fulfilling, to make it happen. Okay? God expects us to work through all these. These may be terrible things and things that we struggle with, but also our responsibilities to work towards fulfilling what we are destined for in, des in eternity. Okay? So a lot to actually uh grasp the the mighty the mighty purpose of god and we recall jesus parables particularly in matthew 25 you know the parables are stories to tell us truths about god's kingdom uh in matthew 25 alone we see three parables the ten virgins you see splitting the people of god into two groups one group is prepared and ready for when he comes. They have their oil, oil lamps ready for him. 
right? And if it's late, they have extra oil. The other group, those who are not ready for him, those who don't prepare themselves uh, for the unexpected thing of his arrival, and then they get shut out. So you have the preparation of people expecting the coming of Christ. Then you have the talents, the second parable of Jesus in Matthew 25, that shows us how we use the resources God gives to us. Yes, have we used the resources God gives to us wisely? So that when he comes, he comes to reward us according to our abilities that we have shown. Ah, so you see, God gives us resources, God gives us abilities, and our life on earth involves how we use these resources and abilities so that we are preparing ourselves for his reward, his response, and his destiny for us in eternity. According to the three servants who responded with the number of talents that they were given. And then you have the third parable, the sheep and the goats, where we see God separating us based on how we respond to people in relationships as if we are responding to Christ. Okay, so you can see that God has a destiny and God expects us to work through. Yes, we may have problems, we may have insecurities and fears and so on. Yes, but God wants us to work through these so that we are prepared for our destiny in eternity. So the fact that God actually allows, the fact that God actually allows is to see what we make of ourselves. Okay. God allows, why did God allow? God allows because he wants to see, or he wants us to see what we make of ourselves by the time we meet him on judgment day. Okay, so that answers the question, why did God allow? So we go on to the next Point, overcoming our self-nature. Now, Nathan told David a simple parable that very aptly described David's sin. Okay, so David had his flaws, his imperfections, as well as his temptations. Okay, maybe I should add on the temptations. God expects us to work through our temptations, negative thoughts, and so on. All right, so... Nathan used a parable to describe David's sin. And in this very gentle, non-confrontational and impersonal approach, so gentle, non-confrontational, impersonal, he was able to draw David's objective judgment of his own sin. Can I say therefore, in the same way, God uses the Bible truths to speak to us, to draw our judgment and conclusion of our own life choices, good and sinful. On to the need to repent and get right with God. Amen. Okay, so I would say that this the Bible, okay, the Bible itself is a gigantic story or parable. The Bible is a big All right, so the Bible is a message, a parable, a story to speak to us, just like Nathan used a simple parable to speak to 
David. So the question is, must we be a uh, must we be approached with every time you know every time we sin, must we be approached with a little parable like Nathan did with David, before we choose to be objective in disciplining our emotions, our pride, our feel good self esteem to face our wrong. What if there's no parable that can so aptly depict our wrong? Okay, what if, what if the pers a person such as Nathan who wants to approach us cannot think of a parable? So without an impersonal parable, it is natural, it's our nature. You know, when somebody confronts us, it is nature Part of our nature to feel the uncomfortable feeling of indignation. How dare you come and say I sin? There yeah, are indignation. We feel offended and we feel hurt when someone is address, addressing us directly with our wrong. But this is a feature and tendency of our own nature, you know, that that the truly dying to self follower of Christ must overcome. So this is where God wants to see our response. Do we die to self? Do we die to self as God has taught in the life of Christ? You know, so we all can be very well versed. Yeah, this concept of dying to self, we all can be very well versed with the Bible and quote multiple scriptures. You know, like, wow, he must become greater, I must become less, John 3.30. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. First John 4, 4. If anyone is in Christ, it's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. You know, we are all very good at Bible verses. Right? So we, we quote so many verses. Yeah. The question is, at the end of it, do we die to self? At the end of knowing our Bible, showing that we know the Bible verses so well, do we die to self? Or we just quote to justify ourselves? You know, and in some circumstances, we may even justify ourselves by saying, uh, the other party is like that, so I'm like this. Oh. If they don't change, I also don't change. Oh. Why should I give way? Why should I forgive? So the wrongs of others make my wrong okay. Yeah, because they do wrong to me, that I do wrong thing, it's okay. It's okay for me to do the wrong thing since they are wrong first, ma, or since they are wrong also, ma, or they do it to me, so I do it back to them, ma. It's only fair one with a tit for tat spirit. You know, so we can quote all the Bible verses to show what a good Christian we are. But whether we die to self, you know, and how do we respond to wrong? The thing we must remember is wrong is wrong, whoever started it first, okay? Wrong is wrong, whoever started it first. And also whoever reacted or responded with wrong is also wrong, yeah? Whoever started it, Doing the wrong thing is wrong. Whoever responds with wrong is also wrong. So when we respond with wrong to wrong, it shows we also harbor the nature to do wrong ourselves. It takes other people's wrong to expose our heart. Yeah, It takes other people's wrong to expose the wrong in our own heart. So that is what God wants us to see. Will the sin of other people expose sin in our own heart by our own response? I, I would like to use the word called resonance. Have you heard of the word resonance? I, I don't have the, the thing here. The idea of resonance is, let's say this is a tuning fork. I hit something, it goes and then you bring another fork near here. And when you bring the fork near within range of the within range of the resonance of this original fork, 
when this second fork comes near to it, it the ringing of the, let's say this red fork will cause the blue fork to also resonate and ring as well. So here God wants to see and God wants us to see for ourselves. Will the thing, sinful thing of wrong thing coming up in other people cause the sinful wrong thing of thing come up in us when we interact, when we come close to each other? Resonance. Yeah. So we cannot say red did the wrong thing, so I also do the wrong thing. It just shows we resonate with wrong. So red is wrong. I, the blue, am also wrong. Okay, so then can we take rebuke and correction over our wrongs without self-justifying like we saw David when he saw himself? Or do we continue to let our own nature, behaviors, and sensitivities triumph? And then we hide behind scripture verses and a public facade of all is right with me because of Christ in me. Christ died for me. I'm saved by grace. I'm a sinner saved by grace, so I can carry on sinning. You know, or the attitude that I can ignore or cover up wrongs. Since I'm doing ministry, you know, sometimes people get the attitude. Since I'm very involved in ministry, yeah, it's okay because I can ignore or cover up my wrongs or because I have good deeds somewhere else, so my wrongs here are okay, excusable. Do we, do we have those, those kinds of unseen, unspoken attitudes? And then we act like David, you know? We actually act like David in marrying Bathsheba to legitimately have the baby. Actually, the baby was conceived out of wedlock in adultery. So in marrying Bathsheba legitimately, now the baby seems to have been born in marriage and appear to be above board. Okay, so you can see the whole idea of our human nature, overcoming our self nature. We have to we have to overcome and not excuse or justify our, our kind of like using God's doctrine to hide behind and hiding behind a respectable, legitimate front. Now remember the Bible made a somewhat incongruent concluding statement in chapter 11, the last sentence. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So no matter how well or beautifully we cover our wrong to look good and justify ourselves, God knows and God is displeased. Okay, so we can see that uh, God responds to our self-nature when we behave like David in his sin of adultery and sin of murder and then covering it up all with a legitimate marriage and baby. Yeah, God can see our fake legitimacy and God is displeased because we try to look correct when we are actually not. Okay, so let's continue what happens after Nathan pronounced uh, consequences on the baby. Can somebody help us to read 2 Samuel chapter 12 from verse 15 to 25? I will read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse mm -hmm. 15 to 25. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that uh, Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the night lie, lying on the ground. The elder of his household stood beside him and got him up from the ground. 
but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servant was afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something disparate. David noticed that his servant was, was supreme among themselves and he realized that the child was dying. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied. He is dead. Then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotion and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house. And at his request, they served him food and he ate. His servant asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who oh, no, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, and because the Lord loved him, he sent words through Nathan, the prophet, to name him Jedia. Amen. Thank you, Chai Den. Okay, so after Nathan went home, then God carried out his action where he struck the child that, you notice, huh? uh, the, the wife, the lady is still called Uriah's wife. It's not David's wife. Yes, he married her, but here in the Bible, the Bible still refers to her as Uriah's wife, not David's wife. Okay. So the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David and he became ill. So the child became very sick and this is where we see David really praying and begging God for the life of the child. Uh, he prayed, he fasted and he lay on the ground for nights, okay? Up to seven nights because the child died, or six nights, the child died on the seventh day. And the elders, they were just so shocked because he refused to eat and he refused to do anything else. Okay, so we see at this, the lesson and the significance we can see in this column is even at this point in time, the Bible refers to Bathsheba as Uriah's wife. She was still Uriah's wife when, when she conceived the child. And for the act of adultery by David and her, the child would die. This is one consequence of sin, death. God struck the sin, struck the child, so that his life hung in the balance. So the child was struggling between life and death. And even though they, Nathan had already pronounced the consequences, David continued to plead with God. Or the life of the child. See, he didn't give up as long as the child was still alive. He didn't give up. He did not accept the prediction of the baby fatalistically. So as long as there's life, there is hope. That's the way David was thinking. And this passage shows how much David cared for the baby and was in anguish till his death. Okay, so you can see that David really cared for the baby. We live in hope of God's boundless sea that we don't deserve. Yeah, we still live in hope, even though we don't deserve, even though you can see the baby is going to die. As long as life remained, there was always hope that God would relent and heal. And David knew it is not whether God can or God is able to heal, 
You know, like in Mark chapter 9, verse 20 to 27, where this man came to Jesus and asked him, if you are able, please heal my child. And Jesus says, if, you know, so Jesus is testing the man to see whether his faith will rise up. And so Jesus asked the man, if I am able to heal, and the man quickly realized that he did not exercise faith. And he said, I believe, please help me in any unbelief, any part of me that does not have enough faith to believe, please help me to top up, help me in my unbelief. So that was a very good response from that man who wanted Jesus to heal his child. Okay, so David knew it was not whether God can or God is able to, but a question of whether God is willing. Okay, not can God, but will God. Is God willing to heal? Okay, and uh, in Mark chapter 5, another story where the leprous man came to Jesus and expressed the faith by saying, if you are willing, you, are, you can heal me. So the leprous man had a different kind of faith from the father in Mark 9. The leprous man said, if you are willing. But the father in Mark 9 says, if you can. So different kind of faith, different kind of response. response. But David here knew God can. It's just whether God will. And David's grief was so deep that the elders and servants were anxious for him. Now, whether the elders of the household knew the child was conceived of wedlock, they gave concern and support to David as he fasted and prayed be. So we see that um, it's good that people care. Yes, and indeed they cared for David. And the Bible in verse 18 shows conclusively the child died. And the servants were afraid to tell David what happened. Now, humanly speaking, we may ask why God let the baby die. Again, we ask why. Our thinking may be that the child is innocent. It's not the child's fault. It is the sin of David and Bathsheba, the parents, not the babies. The prayer seems to be denied, and the person they pray for dies. Now, this is an unbi unbiblical response of misdirected faith. Okay, unbiblical response of misdirected faith. There may be some instances of dying people who were healed, and even some people who died and were resurrected in the Bible. Okay, so we have examples of Jairus's daughter raised from the dead. Then that is in Mark 5. Then in Luke 7, we have the nine windows, widow's son. Okay, and then in John chapter 11, we have Lazarus resurrected after four days in the tomb. Yeah, so we can see that there are some instances of dying people healed and even some people resurrected. But it is not normative. Not normative for God to heal all the people being prayed for. Okay, so God did not promise that when you become a Christian, you become a believer or follower of Jesus, that all the people you pray for will be healed. Okay, it is not normative. God did not make that kind of commitment. So people old and young will die for various reasons, simply because this world is not our endpoint destination. Yeah, this world is not the world we are meant to exist in forever. And Jesus emphasized that he alone is the resurrection who gives the dead eternal life. From John 11, 12, uh, 11 verse 25 to 26. So God's intention is for people to focus on living towards the eternal life of glory in Christ. Okay? Living towards, that's the focus, the eternal life of glory in Christ, rather than on earthly things and life, rather than earthly life. Okay, so the death of any loved one we pray for 
should not cause us to backslide or lose faith in God. It's not the end of the story, but many of us, you know, we are so sad, we may backslide, we may lose faith, as if the death of a person that we care for, that's the end of the story. It is not, because that is where eternal life continues in glory. I repeat, eternal life continues in glory. Eternal life on earth continues in living for Christ. But eternal life after, after death continues in glory. Okay, so let's take a very quick look at Colossians 3 verses 1 to 4. Can somebody help us to read that? To remind us, Colossians 3, 1 to 4, let us be reminded. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Thank you, Jack. That's fast and good. Okay, so you see God's intention for us is to living towards eternal life while we are here. So if God is ready that some, some of our loved ones, it's time for them to go, then we should not lose faith in God. We should not backslide. Okay? So if we lose faith, we are backslide or we're disappointed with God, then we show we have not grasped the true purpose of faith in God and our life journey on earth here. If we cannot get over the death of a loved one but blame God instead. Right? And so this is where a lot of Christians who backslide because God didn't heal their loved one they really don't really know what they are here for and if either they don't know or they've totally forgotten god's purpose so when david realized that the servants whispering among themselves meant that the child was dead he just got up from the ground and then he carried on Carry on with life, basically. Yeah, he didn't let it disturb his resumption of normal life. He just carried on with normal life. You know, he washed, he put on lotions. Or so you see, ancient type people, they also have uh, all this, all this stuff to make up and make themselves look good and look clean and all that sort of stuff. He put on lotions, he changed his clothes, and then he went to worship God. And then he went home. And then he ate food. You see, he just carried on with life as normal. So we see that David took a very practical approach to his baby's death. And he carried on with normal life and worshipped God. See, he can still worship God. He did not lose faith in God. He did not blame God. He was not angry with God. Three things that we that we, a lot of us, struggle with. Lose faith in God, blame God, angry with God. He submitted to God's prerogative to heal or not. God alone is sovereign and knows what is best. And God calls for faith, trust, and very importantly, focus. So a practical response, okay? Practical. Not just talk only. Just talk only. Don't just talk about faith and trust. All those are inside. But he wants us to express it, the focus of practical response on what we are to fulfill in our lives. What should we be doing? What should we be doing? So David got back to normal life. So do we get angry with God and blame him when we find that he does not answer our prayer or prayers to heal? We backslide, lose faith, turn away from him. David worshipped God. 
even though he did not get what he wanted from God. He knew the reason for worship is not that God gives him what he wants, what he prays for. Same, just like why did God allow, just now, why could God allow Uriah to die? God is not a genie or cosmic servant to grant our wishes and wants. God has a greater purpose than just answering our prayers with yes, 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 like he's a genie at our command. So his servants were very puzzled and didn't understand his reaction. So they asked him, how come the child was alive? You fasted, you wept, and then you lay on the floor uh, in sorrow, and now the child is dead. You just get on with life and eat. And so he answered, oh, he took a very practical approach. Okay, so the serpents, they didn't understand and they were unprepared for his reaction. Because you see, they thought he might do something desperate. Verse 18, they thought he might do something desperate. Here it is. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. So to their surprise, David was calm. Uh, David was normal. It's not that he's crazy, you know. Sometimes uh, we see a person who was so agitated and everything suddenly becomes normal. We, we worry for the person. Oh dear, is the person tr in trauma, you know? But no, not David, okay? David was calm and normal. Uh, he was not in trauma. Uh, he was not going to do something desperate and, and end, him, end his life or anything like that. David explained that as long as the child was alive, he could intercede for his life. He knew it was useless to pray for the child since it was dead or to blame God because God made it clear for him the, the baby will not come back. David knew he would go to the same shadowy world that the child had entered, but there was no hope of the child returning to this life. So in other words, from here we see David knew there is life after death. Okay. That's the truth. There is life or existence after death. Not like some people believe once you die, psh, you disappear. There's nothing else to think about or to look forward to because you are gone and you're totally gone. Here, David knew that it's life, there's still existence after death. The child does not disappear into nothingness on death. Okay, upon death. Child does not disappear into nothingness upon death. And the Bible shows us God is the living God of the living. So how many things are living? God is the living God of the living. God is alive and he is the alive God of the people who are alive. And the New Testament, Jesus explains this means he's not only the living God, but he's also the God of the children of the resurrection to eternal life. God of the children of the resurrection to eternal life. How about that? Yeah, he's a living God, he lives. And he's also God of those who will be resurrected to eternal life, never to die again. And that is what David knew. David knew there's an eternal life after death. And he was not ready to go. He was not desperate enough to go to it, follow the baby and go. Okay, so we have the doctrine that there is still existence. We don't disappear into nothingness after physical death. So next thing is David comforted his wife Bathsheba. Aha. So this is the second time the Bible mentions her name Bathsheba, but the first time mentions, refers to her as David's wife. First time referred to as David's wife. And so for the first time, the Bible author acknowledged Bathsheba as David's wife. Why? Because every connection she had 
with Uria, her husband, has now ceased because of his death and because of the, the death of the child conceived while she was still Uriah's wife. So every connection to Uriah had ended with death. Just like Jesus says, right? Or, or the New Testament in Corinthians, we learn that a woman is bound to her husband in marriage until he dies. So Uriah has died and the baby conceived conceived while still married to him has also died. So now the Bible author acknowledges Bathsheba as David's wife. She now had a new role in her life. Okay, she had a new role in her life. The second child of their union is seen to enjoy God's divine favor. So they have a second baby that lives. And we see that they named him Solomon. And because God loved him, God actually sent a message through prophet Nathan to give him the name Yedidiah, which means loved by the Lord. Okay, so God confirms his favor to this baby through a message through prophet Nathan. And this shows that while punishing David, God was not forgetting Israel. You see, even as God punishes, God still works in his sovereign plan for the good of his people. Yeah. So sometimes Christians may fight, but we still see blessings from God. Sometimes Christians sin, but we still see blessing from God. Why? Because if God waits for the person, for the Christian to be perfect, then everybody will be extinct before blessings come. Yeah, God cannot wait for people to be perfect before he blesses. God is still working out his sovereign plan. And while David is the sinner and he's facing consequences, God is still working for Israel's good. So it is not, it does not justify David's sin. It does not excuse David's sin, right? It is God's grace. God's grace to Israel. And because of God's grace to, grace to Israel, it came through David. So David enjoyed the blessing in that sense. Okay? Not because of David's goodness or righteousness. I repeat, not because of David's goodness or righteousness. So sometimes we may be wrong, uh, but we still find God blessing us. Don't think God, God is actually approving or justifying or God accepts our wrong as okay. No, okay? Because God still has a plan for the good of the whole. Not, it's not just about you and me. So Solomon's birth was God's way of fulfilling his promise. In chapter 7, verse 12 and 13, remember, uh, David wanted to build God's house, the temple, but God said he would build David's house, which is lineage, David's lineage to the throne. Okay? So God's plans for the future were laid. See, God works in a much bigger scheme of things than we humans think. Yeah. We humans think that David doesn't deserve anything, which is true, which is true, but God can still bless. Not so much for David himself, but more for the bigger picture of God's people. So David's discipline is for harvest of good in the future. Uh, sorry, God's discipline, right? For, is for a harvest of good in the future. No matter how unpleasant it may seem during the time that people go, the pain and the suffering. Remember, the discipline of God is because God loves us. But through it all, God works for good. You remember your Romans 8, 28 and 29. For those who love and honour him. Mistakes do not terminate God's purpose for us unless we choose to stray and never return. 
Okay, so we move on to chapter 12 now and reading from verse 26 to 31, the end of the chapter. Can somebody read for us? Okay, I'll read uh, verse 26. Meanwhile, Joab was fighting against Rabbah, the city of Ammon, the capital of Ammon, and he captured the royal fortifications. Joab sent messengers to tell David, I have fought against Rabbah and captured its water supply. Now bring the rest of the army and capture the city. Otherwise, I will capture it and get credit for the victory. So David gathered the rest of the army and went to Rabbah, and he fought against it and captured it. David removed the crown from the king's head, and it was placed on his own head. The crown was made of gold and set with gems, and it weighed 75 pounds. David took a vast amount of plunder from the city. He also mixed slaves of the people of Rabbah and forced them to labor with saws, iron picks, and iron axes, and to work in the brick cleans. This is how he dealt with the people of all the Ammonite towns. Then David and all the army returned to Jerusalem. Thank you, Mac. Okay, so we see that uh, this story of David's adultery is actually embedded in the midst of the war that we, we read in the earlier chapter. And now we find the, the closing part of the war. All right, so the whole episode was actually happening during a period of war. And so that's why the Bible says, meanwhile, Joab fought against the Ammonites and he captured them, yeah, the royal citadel. And then he told David, you, I've taken the water supply. Now quickly you come and capture the city. Otherwise I will take the credit for the city. Okay, so the Bible account returns us to this bigger picture of the period of David's fall. Like I said, in the midst of victory, there is also spiritual defeat, right? So now we come back to the rising to the victory. Israel was engaged in a war against the Ammonites and this section rounds off the victory. Uh, we see once again that Joab demonstrated his loyalty to David. The last time he showed loyalty to David was helping David to get Uriah killed. Now he demonstrated loyalty to David by um, responding to David with his victory. David entrusted him with attacking Rabbah and he was successful. So he deferred to David by giving David the chance to capture Rabbah, that is the capital city of the Ammonites, huh? and then take ownership of the city and name it after him. Just like he named Zion after, uh, he named Zion David's city. Okay, so you can see that uh, Joab was really loyal. If you look at him as a general, as a commander, he was uh, willing to let David gain the credit rather than take it himself. So David got the whole army to capture Rabbah and then he took the crown from their king and it was a heavy crown about 34 kilograms. Can you imagine 34 kilograms uh, of gold and precious stones and he actually wore it on his head. Must be very heavy, 34 kilograms. Anybody tried wearing something 34 kilograms on your head? I think you'll feel it's, you will feel it's not a, a light, enjoyable thing, right? But he took a great quantity of plunder from the city and then he made the people there work he made them work, he set them to work. And he did this with all the uh, Ammonite towns 
And so he returned to Jerusalem in victory. So what can we learn? What, what lessons can we uh, discover? We see that once again, God was with David and blessed his leadership in battling Israel's enemies. So he was back to fulfilling his purpose. The first time he was at Jerusalem, at a time in spring when kings went to war, he was not there. He was not fulfilling his purpose, but now he is fulfilling his purpose, back on track. When we repent and turn from straying back to our purpose, God continues to work in our lives. So you see, when we backslide, God is so gracious, he doesn't hold it against us. In his mercy, he shows those who choose to antagonize his so-called, his called to be different people, his holy people. Yeah? Holy people. Those who antagonize his holy people, he shows that they will lose out. It is not that God's people deserve better. Okay? It's not that God's people deserve better, but all of us, need his grace and mercy. Okay? It's not that we deserve better than other people, but it's simply God's grace and mercy. He is willing to bless those who are not perfect, but who strive to serve his purposes. And one of, the, one of his purposes includes a witness to the unbelieving the disobedient, that means the non-Christians, and also the disobedient and unbelieving Christians to acknowledge him, right? So his purposes is for both Christians and non-Christians, and he will use those who are willing but are imperfect. And to both groups, to both groups, the imperfect people of God and the unbelievers, of God and the unbelievers. God wants to be seen and acknowledged as the ultimate king who favors, who blesses, and makes kings of them. And that's what he is doing here. He made David king. Right? David took the crown from the head of their king. So, their, the, their king's glory is taken over by, by David and the glory of gold and precious stones was placed on David's head. So God blesses, yes, God blesses his king because he wants to be seen and acknowledged as the ultimate king. Okay, God wants to be seen and acknowledged as the ultimate king who makes kings of people like David. He's imperfect, true, but he's still willing to work on his purpose when he comes back on track again. So we see that God wants to teach a lesson. God wants to teach a lesson. God works with a good plan for people. Okay, God works with a good plan for people. The only issue is if only they understand what he wants, what he wants to achieve, okay? Even though we may not fully understand God and his purposes, it is simple faith and obedience that will enable us to fulfill his purposes. And our personal... Simple faith and obedience. We don't need all that much knowledge. Simple people of faith who are not trained with a lot of knowledge like many of us want. Even the simplest people with simple, simple faith can fulfill God's purposes. So we don't need to, have, to know everything about God. And to keep asking why, 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 and not be obedient and responsive to God is just, just a waste of time and waste of life. Yeah, of course, 
it is good to know certain things so that we can answer people up to a certain extent. But that is from there where faith needs to take over, just like an aeroplane, you know, you can run on the solid ground, on solid facts, on solid truth, up to a certain point. But beyond that, you have to have the faith to lift you off in your journey with God. Yeah. So ultimately, faith has to take over, no matter how much we know and how much we know and understand. Okay, so we we have covered quite a lot about the adultery and all that of David, um, and we didn't really have a chance to discuss. So here are two options: we can carry on the lesson, or anybody wants to bring up certain burning issues, certain issues you feel are important. Uh, otherwise, if I just carry on the lesson, it will finish the lesson time. Anybody has anything significant you want to raise? Okay, if not, uh, then uh, what we can do is we can just carry on to the next section, which will probably take up the rest of today's timer. Huh? Okay, so let's continue then. Chapter 13, can somebody help us by reading verse 1 to 22? Ammon and Tamar, two children of David. Okay, I'll read. Verse 1. In the course of the time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of Can David. read a bit louder. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, but you're a bit soft. The rest can hear? Let's think, let's think. Ah, oh, a little bit louder. That's... Is this okay? Um, better. Okay, uh, I'll start again. In the Thank course you. of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. She was a virgin and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now, Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of Shemel. David's brother, Jonadab, was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do, you, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab say. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tama to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. Verse 6. So Abnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat from her hand. Verse 7, David sent word to Tamar at the palace. Go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon was, who was laying down, lying down. She took some dough, kneeled it, made the bread in his sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left. Then Amnon said to Tama, bring the food here into my bed so I may eat from your hand. And Tama took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon and in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. 
No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You will be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, Get up and get out. No, she said to him, Sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, Get this woman out of my sight and bolt the door after her. So his servant puts her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing an omnet robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tama put ashes on her head and tore the omnet robe she was wearing. She put her hands on her head and went away weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon? Your brother been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tama lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. And Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Thank you, Kelvin. All right, so this is where the story of David's personal life starts going downhill because of the, because these are consequences of what he had done wrong. And so we can see that consequences are going to really play out with serious sin. Okay, so this incident begins the woes that will dock the royal house throughout much of the remainder of 2 Samuel. Okay, all the problems that will come into David's uh, family. And so you see that in the course of time, uh, this the Amnon is actually the firstborn son of David. All right, and he saw this sister Tama, and she was so beautiful, he fell in love with her. And uh, Kelvin's version actually said that she, he was obsessed with her and made himself ill. All right, so it is his own fault. It is his own fault that he did not manage himself and his, and his, uh, in his last. So let's have a little bit of background. At Salon and Tamar were David's children by Ma'aka. This is the princess of Tal princess Talmai, king of Geshur. Right in chapter three, verse three, we have met her. Uh, we read her name. She's the mother of Absalom at that time. So now we know there is also a sister Tamar, and Amnon was the firstborn son of David, the eldest son. And his love was a lustful passion that was frustrated, was an obsessive love. Because Tama, who was a virgin of marriageable age, that's what the Bible means uh, by saying she was a virgin, she was marriageable age. She was chaperoned, that means she had somebody who always who was always with her to the extent that he could not get to be alone with her. So he always saw her with somebody and he could not just spend that one-to-one -one time with her, okay? So Amnon had a friend and that was actually the cousin. Yonadab was uh, the son of David's brother, okay? And this, this Yonadab was a very shrewd man and he could tell, okay? He could tell something was the matter with Amnon because he said, you look haggard morning after morning. So he has been observing Amnon, right? He's a very shrewd man. He had been observing Amnon for mornings, morning after morning. And he asked 
Amnon to confide in him. And Amnon said, I'm in love with my sister Tama. Uh, yeah. So Amnon had the listening ear and help of his resourceful, shrewd, and observant cousin. So this guy, Yonadab, was actually a very intelligent person. All right? And Amnon regarded him as a friend. See? Amnon had a friend. Regarded him as a friend. And Yonadab was able to draw Amnon out. Draw Amnon out to share about what was troubling him. We see that Amnon had someone to confide in about his love. It is good to have a friend and confidant. A confidant is a person that we share secret or private matter with, and we trust them not to repeat it to others. Trust them to keep it a secret. So people or we actually need a listening ear and a sounding board at times. We need somebody to listen to our woes and our struggles perhaps. A confidant who listens carefully and gives good advice helps people to see that there's a different perspective from what they see, uh, think clearly and make good decisions. So a good confidant helps people to see, helps people to think and helps people to decide. A confidant is most important when people need a word of correction also or a word of rebuke to turn them back to deter or dissuade them from harboring negative attitudes, making bad choices, taking the wrong course of action. Also, a confidant is a friend who needs to play a very important role in our lives. What kind of confidant do we make in real life? Or what kind of confidant do we have? Right? So it's a very important person to be a confidant. So Jonadab has got this idea and he tells Amnon, you go to bed and you pretend to be sick. Lah. Then when your father comes, you tell him you want your sister Tama to come and feed you and let her prepare the food so that you can see her doing it and then eat from her hand. So Yonadab has this, you want to call it ingenious or you want to call it devious scheme, idea or plan that gave Amnon not just a way to get Tama to go to his bed chamber, his bedroom, but to do it with the authority of the king's permission. You see, this guy is really smart. He thinks of how he can get the king to support, to support Amnon's request. It was a diabolical, a wicked eh? and cunning way to hide Amnon's unhealthy passion in the clothing of a sick man's fondness for his half-sister. Yeah, so it looks good for Amnon to have this plan, but in terms of how it affects other people, it affects, it's a bad plan. As a confidant, Yonadab did not give Amnon advice to deal with his unhealthy passion, but instead he went along with it and supported it with a plan that would lead to dire or serious consequences. You know, sometimes we people think that we are being helpful, but we are actually worsening the situation with our advice when we fail to think about how it will cause a negative impact on people. Yeah, so this is Yonada trying to be helpful to Amnon, but not good, giving very good advice. So Amnon lay down and then he pretended to be sick and the king came to visit him and he made his request for Tama to come and make bread and feed him. And David fell into the trap, okay, and complied with his request and got, got Tama to come. And so Tama went to the house of a brother Amnon lying down. She took some dough, she kneaded it, she made the bread in his sight and she baked it. Okay, then she took the pan and she served him the bread. But he said, no, I'm not eating. Okay, so what can we see? 
Well, Amnon actually carried out Yonadab's uh, suggestion and pretended to be sick. And the king visited him and he seemed to make a legitimate request. And so David had no reason to suspect anything wrong with it. And David unwittingly gave permission for Tamar to come. And the narrator, you see, narrator actually takes the time to time and the words to describe the detail, how Tama prepared the cakes, okay, prepared the food, hinting at the loving care that, that she took in performing the task while Amnon watched her. So Tama's attitude was very positive. She had loving care in doing what was asked of her. But this description also has the effect of slowing down the narrative with an element of suspense. Element of suspense, what is going to happen? What is Amnon going to fulfill his desire with Tamar? You know, so it slows down the story to kind of like go through the process of Tamar making the bread with care and then when the bread was ready, he put on the show of not wanting to eat it. And he put, it, put on the show for his attendants to hear. And then after that, he sent them out and made the sister bring the food into the bedroom. So going to his bed. Now his intentions were not above board or honorable. Each step that he took, he was actually drawing Tama deeper into his trap his lust, his deceit, and his brutality. The interval of time when his plan is slowly being carried out is actually the time when the person should be, who wants, uh, the person who wants to be right with God needs to snap out of it. You see, the things happen are happening and in the process, if, if a person really wants God to be in charge, there is the interval where he should allow God to, hey, wake up, that's wrong, stop him. Okay, how, how can he stop? By activating the battle in the mind. Instead of letting the temptation of wrong turn into the act of reality. Okay, the so temptation is just something inside there that he should fight against by activating his mind to stop it from turning into the act in reality. Now, as the eldest son of David, Amnon was obviously not a suitable, not a suitable man to rule Israel, the nation of God set apart holy people. Because he was acting in a deceitful way with his own half-sister. He went all the way with his dishonorable plan to even tell his half-sister to sleep with him. He said to her, come to bed with me, my sister. Amnon did not even think that what he was doing, did not even think that what he was doing, think about what he was doing and should not be done. Okay, he was not comparing what should not be done with what he was actually doing. So the sister, she was, she was shocked and she said, don't my brother, don't force me. And she says, such a thing should not be done in Israel. This is just like, this is just like, you know, our first Corinthians chapter five, where there was a Christian who was sleeping, committing incest, sleeping with his father's, uh, with his stepmother, his father's wife. And that is something that should not be done among Christians. And here is Tamar saying to her brother, such a thing should not be done in Israel. God's people shouldn't be doing something like this. You see what she said? Don't do this wicked thing. Yes, don't do this wicked thing. And she says, think about me. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? You know, if you, if you make me sleep with you, where do I hide my face? Where do I hide my disgrace? What about you? So she puts the perspective, how it will affect you, how it will affect me. What about you? 
you would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Remember uh, Nabal, the husband of Abigail? You would be a fool, just like, just like Nabal. Of course, Tama doesn't know about Nabal. Yeah, but she used the word fool. You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. And she to delay him, she says, please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. So we should not do this thing uh, unless we are married. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger, he raped her. So not, not a very nice conclusion to this particular episode at this point. And so what we can see is Tama pleaded with Amnon to refrain because he was doing something that should not be done as God's people. But what was his response? No listening, no stopping. He just allowed his desire to become greater than he could control. Amnon's behavior shows there may be God's people who do things that should not be done even as Christians. And we just, I just mentioned that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Yeah, that's an example. So you have things in the New Test Old Testament and things in the New Testament that God's people should not be doing, but still do. People, including Christians, may think it is their right. It's my life, it's my right, it's my body. You know, they, they come up with all their excuses. They think it is their right to do what they want. Perhaps because they are in a safe position or status, to do what they like without consequences to themselves, or they think they will not get caught even if it's wrong. You know, so people have all kinds of reasons they justify themselves. But it is wicked and it is a disgrace to God's reputation and the victims, the people who are affected. Now, the Bible itself in the law of Moses already forbid marriage with a half-sister. Can somebody help us? Leviticus 18, 11, and another person, Deuteronomy 27, 22. Okay, I read. Uh, Leviticus 18 verse 11 Do not have sexual relations with your stepsister the daughter of any of your father's wife for she is your sister Thank you Alright, so uh, no sex with a half-sister Deuteronomy 27, 22 It's uh... Uh, verse 22, because it is the man who sleeps with his sister, the doctor of his father, or the doctors of his mother, then all the people shall say, Amen. Thank you, Chai Dan. So there you have, yeah. uh, cursed is the man who sleeps with the half-sister. Right? Okay. So Tama suggested, so the, the law of God in the Old Testament already said no sex between half-siblings. And Tama suggested perhaps the king had the authority to suspend this law. You see, he says, uh, please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. Now, whether she said this to hopefully stop Tamar or she truly believed the king could suspend the law, right? Uh, the reality is people do indeed think that we can change or we can adjust God's law to accommodate we would like to do or what we would like to see happening. Yeah, so, so we, we as God's people, you know, we think that the Bible is the Bible, la, but that is uh, so many thousand years ago. La, all right, so now is a different time. You know, we should update. We should go change with the times. Uh, we, should, we should modernize and all those sorts of things. So people think that we can change or we can adjust God's law. To keep up with not being a dinosaur or outdated and so on but we don't realize that if we change god's law to fit what we want we're actually compromising the holiness of god the differentness of god and our integrity 
as an ambassadorial people, as we are God's ambassadors who represent God and his kingdom values. Okay, so you can see the Old Testament people, sometimes they, they, they do things or they think that you can adjust the law of God, not human law. They can adjust the law of God, not realizing that it will, it will actually damage certain purposes that God wants to accomplish. Yeah, so we don't understand, we just want to change. So then what we don't realize is uh, God's people become no different. God's kingdom of heaven is just like on earth. There's no difference. Now what's the point? Yeah, so Amnon raped her and then after sleeping with her, he hated her with intense hatred. Oh, it has become so opposite. Just now it was an obsessive love. Now it is an intense hatred. So you see, in fact, he hated more than he loved her. And so he just said, get lost. Yeah. So we see that Amnon showed he really did not love Tama. His situation was actually overcome by lust. It was actually overcome by lust and he only wanted sexual gratification, you know, to please his body. And tragically, after abusing her, he, hated, he ended up hating and rejecting her. So from love to rejection. And we see that lustful sex is not love. And very importantly, it did not fulfill him or give him what he wanted. Did not give him what he wanted. Sex in God's context fulfills more than the pleasure and pressure of our human desires. Yeah, sex is a pleasant, pleasurable experience. Sex can also be a pressurizing experience because it is uh, where you have to, you, you feel the, the burning heat of wanting to have sex. Yeah. So while it does include gratifying the sensual pleasure of desires, this is actually meant to seal to fill and fulfill. Okay, so I use three, three verbs. It's meant to seal, it's meant to fill, and finally it's meant to fulfill. So there's a complete package. Okay, so sex is meant to be a complete package. Yes, it includes pleasure. Yes, it includes pleasure, but it comes as a package of a deep and intimate relationship. This relationship is of love, sharing, companionship, partnership. Okay, so of course it must be deep and intimate. That's why you have marriage. Two become one, two individuals who become one in identity, two become one. Uh, because you need the time and the process to make all these things happen. Yeah, you need the time and the process to make it deep, to make it intimate, to make love, sharing, companionship, partnership happen. So that is the first thing. Seal, fill, fulfill. Let me put those highlighted. And the second thing is work okay one is relationship second is work work that god attaches to sex which includes having and raising ch uh, offspring children in the lord okay so after sex is when you have your child conceived and that's where you start having your work of having children and then the third thing is there's the mission and the purpose. God's mission and purpose. To fill the earth and populate it so as to rule over creation with godly grace as God instituted with Adam and Eve. And that would be in Genesis 1 verse 28. Genesis 1 28 where it talks about fulfilling, filling the earth, populating the earth. Right, and then ruling over all of creation. 
Can somebody just remind us? Genesis chapter 1. Verse 28. Genesis 1, 28. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Bring over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Thank you. Okay, so we have Genesis 28. So let me write that down in Genesis 1, 28. So the whole idea of sex, yes, is pleasurable, but it also has other things that, that God has, has actually got in mind, right, for the, for the two individuals, right? And a sexual encounter like what Amnon sought and experienced is too shallow, too shallow with God's intentions. So naturally, he found himself unfulfilled. And people, when, when people, especially God's people, fail to do as God directs, they will find themselves as empty at the end. After doing everything, they are still as empty as when they started. Yeah. It didn't fulfill them because it, it doesn't even begin to touch them. <laughs> with what God has uh, behind this act of uh, sexual uh, intimacy and marriage. So she says no to him because he wants to kick her out. She said, no, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you've already done to me. So one wrong is followed by a greater wrong. She's telling him, okay? But you see, he refused to listen to her. When, when we're just, when we are just, stuck in that mode you know, of being stubborn on seeing things our way, we cannot talk, people cannot talk sense to us. Yeah, so he told his servant to kick her out. Okay, so in her plight, Tama seemed to be hoping for the relationship to return to its regular state, if only to cover the shame, right? So she's still trying to salvage what he has already damaged. Yeah, she's trying to salvage what he had already damaged. But Amnon had no shame, not like Adam and Eve, you know, they felt sh ashamed. Um, so he had no shame and no matter what she tried to talk sense, he just wouldn't listen and see that his heart was too calloused and hard, hardened to care for her or to listen to good advice. He had no concern or no regret no concern, no regret over the wrong he had done, and yet no sense of responsibility for what he had done. He just wanted her out of his life. Now that he got what he wanted with her, a sexual experience, but not what he should have got out of a sexual relationship. So here's a difference, an experience or a relationship. So Tama, she was wearing this richly ornamented robe or ornate robe. Okay, this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Now, this, this kind of clothing is actually a status. Okay? Clothing like what uh, Tama wore was a sign, a symbol of her status. The fact that she had a richly ornamented robe or what... Um, Kevin read in his version ornate. That means very elaborate. The, the rope was made very elaborately, which means it took a lot of time and effort to make. It was very precious. It was very expensive. And so she somehow she just tore the rope. She tore the rope. This rope that was very precious symbol of her status it was a symbol, status of her virginity, the king's daughter, the virgin daughter of the king. This was very precious, and now it doesn't apply to her anymore. So you can imagine her grief when she tore it, and then she put ashes on her head. Okay, so what do we see? She was emotionally scarred. The experience was just too bad. 
putting dirty ashes on her head and tearing this particular garment, which is a special one that distinguished her as royalty. And not just as royalty, but as a virgin, was the, the way to express her sorrow and how disturbed she was, how distraught she was. She was pained and hurt by her experience with a brother who should have loved her with a filial love, a brotherly love, right? Filial love is brotherly love uh, that he should have exhibited in a close relationship as a brother. But she had been violated in the body and broken in life. So you can see emotionally scarred, violated in body, broken in life. What, what did she look forward to? What could she look forward to from now on? She could only go into mourning and grieve to herself. You know, and many victims of rape feel the shame and sorrow of what has been done to them, helpless to heal and be restored to normal life and relationships. Their perspectives of many important aspects of life have been become tainted. You know, the way they look at life, the way they look at relationships, the way they look at sex and marriage. Maybe some can be repaired, but for many people, their perspective cannot be repaired. It's really been badly damaged. So she went off and her brother Absalom spoke to her and said, oh, your brother has been with you. And so he tried to comfort her, be quiet now. He's your brother, don't take this too hard. And then he gave her room to live in his house, but she was a desolate woman. So Absalom could see and discover what happened. He could do nothing himself because Amnon was their eldest half-brother. And Absalom could only comfort and advise her to swallow the indignity, forget about it and then let her stay in her home to keep away from Amnon and any bad reminder of those memories. But, you know, the sad thing is the experience lived in her. So she lived in virtual widowhood. That's what they mean by desolate woman. She's virtually a widow, like husband died, even though she has not been married, with her tormented pain and memories. To Absalom, it would be a perpetual reminder of her unavenged violation. He could see her pain, but he couldn't do anything about her wounds and her scars, except brood, hate, and plot. When people don't resolve their negative emotions and issues effectively, you see the wounds will fester and become cancerous. Absalom's cancer would find satisfaction only in revenge. Last bit, when David heard about it, what happened? He was angry, very angry. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, so he ignored this brother, good or bad. He hated Amnon because of his disgracing the sister. And we see that King David was furious. He heard about it, but it was an ineffectual anger. See, the Bible mentions him as King David. So he was king, he was father, but he failed to follow up with appropriate disciplinary actions with his children who were also his subjects, waywardness. There were emotions and issues he did not address. He, didn't, he seemed to have done nothing to resolve the case. He did not discipline or punish the wrongdoer. He did not comfort or ease or try to heal the pain and wounds of the victim. As father, he did nothing beyond getting angry. This was a serious mistake because it only increased Absalom's indignant anger to the point of hatred. He hated Amnon. Right, and this hatred would fester emotionally. And did David's own wrong with Bathsheba interfere with why he did not deal with the son for the similar fault, you know, but the Septuagint speaks explicitly of fatherly indulgence. So the Greek, the Greek version of the Old Testament says he would not hurt Amnon because he was his eldest son and he loved him, right? So this is a father's love for the son 
that did not discipline the son. As a man of God, David did not bring up, that means instruct, train and discipline his sons in the way of the Lord. His faith and commitment to God was his private walk and practice. This is a sad truth that he did not inculcate in his sons. He did not inculcate that kind of faith and commitment in his sons and admonish them. We see that David had been sensitive to the feelings of his men, you know, but he neglected and failed to do the same with his own children. A parent or a man can be a loyal and good friend or brother to others, but lacking when it comes to family. There are also people who are the reverse, devoted to family, but careless of others who are not related in family. A Christian can be involved and effective in ministry with others, but weak and possibly negligent in godly personal and or family development, which opens the door for spiritual disaster that begins at home. The most fundamental ground for spiritual nurture. Okay, so when parents don't deal with the quarrels, the emotions and issues of their children, whether under excuse of love and lack of discipline, problems were fester unseen and unresolved. And we see Absalom silence and inactivity are very bad signs of the future because he pent up his emotions, including hatred, and let them eat him up inside. So how do we address our issues and emotions with people? Okay, so we have crossed a time, I'm sorry, a little bit. Okay, so um, any response, you can just uh, WhatsApp me and let me know. Okay, so we'll stop here for tonight. And you can think through any issues that you might want to, uh, want to ask or talk about. Right, okay, so I have to end here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love. And we thank you, God, that in your mercy to us, Father, you give us your word, the Bible, just like a super long parable but a story no less to tell us to show us and to demonstrate to us what sin is capable of doing if we continue to choose sinful ways and father we thank you god that you have given us the love as well as the discipline and all that is necessary to get us on track and father we pray lord that we will be sincerely uh, fervent in doing our best to respond to you as we ought to for your plan to be fulfilled in us we pray this in jesus name amen